Has anybody doing? How about a hand for John and John and... Well, you know, you, you can always count on business professors to improvise, right? And we do improvise, and obviously, uh, our speaker ran late because of the late arrival at the airport, and then 75 was shut down. What else is new on 75, right? But um, it's nice that we can now get our program started. I want to thank you all for your patience. I do appreciate uh, your understanding. Uh, I try to uh, move things fairly quickly so that we allow our guest speaker to have some time to make his remarks. Um, his biography is well chronicled in the program, so I'm not going to try to take too much time. Uh, but just say a few things uh, about Bill Nuri. Um, uh, he is the chairman, CEO, and president of NCR Corporation, um, which is let's just say a Fortune 500 company. Uh, it's a global technology company. Um, and essentially, according to one reporter, NCR is now the self-service technology giant. Uh, Bill is highly respected throughout the American economic landscape. He is an entrepreneur, he's a leader, he's an inspirational speaker, and we are thrilled that he is here today to be a part of the 2011 Distinguished Dean's Lecture. Uh, Bill's critical decisions in the past have led to the success that NCR enjoys today. Uh, prior to going to NCR, uh, Bill ran Teradata. Um, he also spent a number of years uh, working uh, for Symbol, a company that he turned around from, uh, I would say, perhaps on the brink of collapse. Uh, the rest of Bill's biography is well um, written throughout the business literature and he's well sought after, so we are thrilled and indeed we are very honored that he is here tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Bill Nudy. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when I, uh, I made the decision uh, along with my team to move to Georgia, it was a very controversial uh, decision for, for us in, in Ohio. And the only thing I never really counted on was your traffic. <laughs> um, and uh, we're still very pleased we made the decision, but I apologize to all of you for being late. We were stuck at the airport, we were stuck in traffic, and I think I've learned a lot more about your you know, 75, 285 problems. Um, <laughs> that I hope we're, we're going to help fix over the course of the next few years because we're very committed to the state. We obviously have made a tremendous investment in Georgia. We have thousands of employees here. In 2009, we built a global manufacturing plant here in Georgia, in Columbus. Uh, not many companies around the world, and in particular, uh, U.S.-based manufacturers are building manufacturing plants here in the U.S., and ours is thriving. Uh, our plant here is doing very well. It's one of the best plants, if not the best plant for quality in the world. And it's also, interestingly, in Columbus, it's the only brownfield manufacturing plant that's LEEDS certified. It's clean energy. It's a green plant, and we're very proud of that. That was a big investment we made and will continue to make over the course of the next uh, several years. Uh, that being said, let me, let me kick it right off. A couple of numbers I want you to become familiar with on the top of the screen. Many of you in the audience today, you may not even know it, have used our technology in the last few days. I am sure many of you have checked in using a kiosk at Hartsfield Airport. And if you have, you've used NCR hardware and in some cases software. If you've checked out at Lowe's or Home Depot using self-checkout, if you've gotten cash at an ATM, if you've paid for something via a mobile phone, you're likely to use us. If you're renting 
entertainment at a Blockbuster Express DVD kiosk. You're using us. In some cases, you're making appointments for medical institutions with us. And I can go on. We are uh, in, on seven continents and at sea, by the way, currently. We have offices in 59 different countries, direct sales offices. We're in 190 countries around the world. We now have over 24,000 employees with our most recent acquisition of Radiant Systems, also here in Alpharetta, Georgia. And every single day on our technology, we conduct about 300 million transactions. So NCR has a great perspective about the consumer, about global business. And we're a changed company in so many ways, and I want to share with you today a little bit more about our company and, and what we have been doing to change. Our journey as a company began a long time ago. We, we were founded in 1884, and our founder, John Patterson, ended up buying some intellectual property for the first, what we would know today as a cash re register. And his goal wasn't, in essence, to go out and find intellectual property for the cash register. He, he had to do two things first before he went out and convinced businesses to invest in the cash register. The first thing he had to do was he had to convince business owners that the fact of getting a receipt was good for a few reasons. One, he was concerned about theft from employees. A lot of businesses back in the day didn't have cash registers, no way to account for transactions. So if you had receipts, you can eliminate pilferage. He also had to convince the government that he wanted businesses to have receipts so they can collect on tax receipts from business. So he created the business system before he went out and bought the IP and the technology for the first cash register. And that's how NCR was founded on that business system of the creation of a receipt. Over the many years, he did some other interesting things, but built a very significant company. And by 1885, a year after we were founded, we actually built our first office in the UK. We were the first international, multinational, American company. Very first. And John Pedersen went overseas very quickly. In 1906, Charles Kettering, inside of our company, built the first automated cash register, motorized cash register, 1906. And that's the same Kettering from Memorial Sloan Kettering family. Charles was brilliant. He was one of our top executives in the company. And he built the first motorized cash register. 1938, NCR, a gentleman by the name of Desch, who is very well known. If you've ever seen the, there's been a chronicle on him of the Enigma Code, Germany's Enigma Code. He broke it for the US, second only to the Manhattan Project in terms of confidentiality. You know, over 50 years, our, our Desch NCR employee broke that code for the US government, but created a lot of computing technology starting in 1938. and was a founder of a lot of patents for computing, basic computing. If you go further in our history, we've done a lot of interesting things that affect your life today. In 1968, Janning, an employee of NCR, created the LCD, the first LCD display. We own the patents for LCDs. NCR has an incredible heritage of innovation, which we continue today. It's, it's very much at its roots a technology company. And in the most recent history, the company has done a brilliant job of continuing its innovative roots. 
I won't give you any more descriptors on that except to say if you go to a SunTrust bank today and you use their ATMs and perhaps you can use it now for automated deposit where it takes your cash and check in a single slot. That's called a scalable deposit module. We brought that to market in 2010 um, and is the only one of its kind in the industry today that allows consumers to go to an ATM and put cash and checks in a single slot simultaneously in any orientation and the ATM to recognize that immediately. We also have transformed the company into a self-service expert, a, a company that other companies come to to talk to about their needs for self-service. And self-service has been part of our lives forever. There's a constant move to self-service. It's continuous. And you know, you can go back to the days when you needed an, a, an operator to make a telephone call, to connect you from one person to another. That was automated. You can go back to the fact that there were, used to be elevator operators before buttons. Very early instantiations of the move to automation and self-service where you, as a consumer, took over workflow and process. Why? Because you wanted more control. You wanted higher quality. You wanted greater convenience. And time became more and more of an asset to you. Also, businesses were and constantly seek out productivity advantages. We are on the everlasting focus to drive greater levels of productivity in our business. And it's not our only niche today, self-service, but we are extraordinarily good at it in understanding how you as a consumer connect, interact, and transact with business in ways that are quite unique. At NCR, we're, we've gone through, a, it's very difficult to say it's a, a lot of people use words like turnaround and, and transformation and, and, and the like, but we have not, we've gone through much more than that. To be around 127 years, to survive 13 decades, and all that has happened in that time frame, you have to be a company that can constantly reinvent itself. And there are times in that history that you need to reinvent yourself in more prolific ways, more significant ways. And we've reached that over the course of the last few years. But we live in a very complex world. Today, growth is very difficult to achieve. Today, productivity is very difficult to achieve. If you think about the global conundrum we have today, we're living it right now in terms of the difficulties we have in developed markets like the US, like Western Europe, the EU 15 in particular, and like Japan. If you think about just the US today, for us to get back to the GDP growth we used to enjoy for the last few decades, our productivity as a measure of per, per capita, as a percentage of per capita, has to grow 34%, from about 1.7 to about 2.3% of GDP. Let me, let me assure you, growing productivity 34% from current state is not possible. Not in the short term. And labor unit growth in the U.S. as a percentage of GDP is declining or flattening and therefore we're in an environment where our GDP growth will continue to be low single digit at best, particularly over the medium to long term. We also have an aging population and that presents other problems Other problems like the cost of entitlements. Other problems like labor unit growth. 
our population growth isn't growing as well. So there are productivity gaps that we're trying to help solve at our company. Our solutions, our technology, gives our customers an ability to close that huge gap. Because in aggregate, if we can provide all of our customers with the ability to grow productivity significantly, 30-40% per year, we are a part of solving for that issue. By the way, if the U.S., from a government point of view today, were to embrace self-service in totality and use it for government-based applications, the U.S. government would save $130 billion. Think about how much is done today manually that is not automated in government. They can be automated. And I have a bit of a stimulus package for you <laughs> that we can use currently. We're also hoping to try to solve bigger social issues. The unbanked problem in the world is massive. There are four billion adults in the world today. Two and a half billion of those four billion are unbanked. They're not part of financial inclusion. They're not part of the banking process. We have countries we're doing business with, a country today, that is so fed up with the issues associated with financial inclusion, they're slowing down large bank purchases of ATMs so that they force those banks to think about the unbanked, the rural population of people that need to participate in the financial system. That's how heady this issue is. Emerging markets. Another area we focus on. In 2005, NCR's revenue in the emerging markets was quite small. Today, it's about 25% of our revenue. Huge jump in that time frame. Why? Because by 2030, 93% of the middle class will live in emerging markets. The emerging markets will grow from about 6.7% trillion dollars of consumer spending today to about three times that 21 trillion, doubling that of the U.S. in consumer spending. And tremendous growth potential exists there. And we're trying to imagine this world where we can impact productivity, where we can impact social issues like the unbanked population, and in fact, deal with these massive changes taking place in emerging markets. We didn't get here without a lot of hard work and heavy lifting. I mean, massive amounts of work have been done by my team. And back in 06, we really started to get focused on this journey of how do we reinvent NCR? Most recent history of NCR is very spotted. In the 1990s, we were acquired by AT&T. It was a very difficult time for NCR. AT&T did a poor job of integration, at best. We lost some of our best talent. And when we were spun out again in 1997, we were spun out with Lucent and others, Avaya. We were spun out half of the company we once were when we were acquired for over $7 billion in 1991. And we were losing money. Innovation was not part of our mission every day we came to work. We were breaking the social contract with our employees. And we were in a conditional state that many companies find themselves in, in when they're in this position of needing to cut costs to survive. And we did that. We did it quite well for a few years. But you cannot cut your way to greatness. At some stage, you have to wake up and say, I need to grow. I need to be part of what is next. And that is what we did. We began to reimagine our company as a growth company. Very difficult to do with the current culture 
that was sustained by these many years of neglect. And it takes a long time to, to transform a culture like that. And by the way, we're not done. But we've made some incredible, difficult, challenging decisions and have done them quite well. We, we in 2006, we had one, we were down to one manufacturing plant in the world. It was in Dundee, Scotland. Now, Dundee, Scotland is not the manufacturing center of the universe. They're nice people. It's a wonderful place. But this is not the place you want to center your manufacturing prowess, your, your center of excellence. We moved out of Dundee and subsequently moved into five manufacturing plants. Budapest in Hungary, Puducherry in India, Beijing in China, in the Amazon in Manaus, and here in Columbus, Georgia. We built a large manufacturing network of five plants. Why did we do that? And by the way, if you counted those five, how many of them were in emerging markets? Four. So there was a method to our madness back in 06, which is we need to position the company for success longer term on a global basis in parts of the world that were closer to our customers and closer to where there was going to be large amounts of business, at least to be competed for. We moved a thousand people out of Dundee. Three stayed. Three. 997 unfortunately did not. Massive reorganization to get that done. Huge amounts of capital spent. Tremendous amount of hard work. And that was the beginning of one of the most important parts of our reinvention, which is the notion of having a global manufacturing and supply chain network. The ability to serve your customers globally in many different countries. In 07, we decided to spin out Teradata. For those of you who know who Teradata is, they're a large enterprise data warehousing company. They also have a presence here in Georgia. And they were part of NCR. They had been part of NCR since 1991. We acquired them. And we spun them out. And at the time we spun them out, with Teradata, NCR's market cap was about $6 billion with them. And just five or six years later, without them, when we spun them out, they as a standalone company have an $11 billion market cap. So we have to separate these two companies. And when you separate two companies within your own company, by the way, it's the new off-fay M&A today. If you notice, every company is doing this today, spinning, them, you know, spinning out divisions recently. It's like the new M&A. Because there's huge value to be gained by doing that if you do it for the right reasons. And when we did it in 07, we did it for the right reasons. Two different companies, two different end markets, two different technologies, two different p &Ls, contention of resources every single day, two great companies who weren't getting funded enough to do what they do great, to do what they do well. So we changed that. And both companies are thriving today, and both are great companies. And that's a wonderful measure of success when you do a spin. We, throughout the years, moved some other big rocks. The headquarters move to Georgia was massive for us. We had been in Dayton, Ohio for 125 years. That was a very big decision for our company, to move to Georgia. A courageous decision, a difficult decision, but the right decision because, again, the foundation was how do we stay alive for another 127 years as we reinvent NCR? How do we become a great company? And we need to position the company in an area where a skills pool is wider and deeper, where there's competitiveness for talent, where the infrastructure could allow us to grow and expand. And of course, there are other intangibles to those decisions, but those were a couple of big decisions we made. Today, we have to be poised for a new world. 
We live in a world of two halves, a developed world and an emerging world. And both have interesting and unique needs. For those of you doing business planning or in MBA classes, if you take away one thing from the presentation, take away this. As you plan for a business today, there was once a time, a short time ago, a year or two ago, when you looked at the world as one thing. It is no longer the way you look at the world. You have developed market characteristics and you have emerging market characteristics and both are different and you need to plan for and invest differently for each one of those halves. Expect developed markets to grow low single digits. Expect emerging markets to grow mid single digits. By the way, those are huge differences. Expect there to be much more competition in all markets, but in particular in emerging markets because you have local competitors who want to win in those emerging markets. China has industries competing against our own that don't compete outside of China. Brazil has industries that compete with ours that don't compete outside of Brazil and so on. And that will continue over the long term. And you have to think about cost as being a key ingredient to your success. Because in many ways in the future, as you think about this world of two halves, cost equals growth. Why does cost equal growth? It's very simple. If I can build a product for zero cost, I can gain all the market share I can in industry. I can't lose. It has to have high quality, of course. It has to be pertinent and real, of course. But again, if I could build a product for zero, I would win all the business. So whoever gets closest to zero first wins. Because these are highly competitive markets. And as the world gets smaller, not larger in terms of opportunity, and it is getting smaller, GDP on a global basis will be smaller next year than it is this year. You have the same number of competitors competing for less stuff. And in those environments, you have more competition, more desperate competition, margins get compressed, and you need to be very focused on what we are focused on, which is building a disruptive innovation culture. A culture that thinks about quantum changes in cost structure for our products and our services. A company that knows you have to have a cost structure of your product or services that is about half of what it is today while you double the quality and provide your customers with four times the value. How do you do that is a very difficult and challenging endeavor, but you must do that. We must do that. GE is doing it. How many of you are familiar with their MRI project? Just raise your hand. So you, you know what they've done. Uh, they've taken an MRI in the US that traditionally cost about $1.6 million, went to China and India and built it for about $700,000 to $900,000. Their sales doubled in emerging markets and mature markets because they took that product and exported that quantum change in cost, the quantum change in quality to other markets. That is what we and other companies must focus on doing over the course of the next few years. We, we talked about the unbanked earlier, but we, what you need to realize is that in some markets, like Africa, there are countries and consumers bypassing traditional forms of banking. In some markets, consumers are doing their banking over their mobile phone in Africa today. In fact, it's one of the largest applications in many countries. You, that may be shocking to you, but it's quite true. Mobile banking is a massive opportunity. Mobile remittance is a huge opportunity. 10% of the GDP of the Middle East is based on remittances. Remittances today. That is money transfer. Intra and inter-country. Massive market for remittances. 
And a lot of that will be done via mobile devices, via the ATM, kiosks, over the web. We are preparing our company to lead in this space, and in many cases provide solutions today to do so. Companies are thinking differently, though, in order to how to get there. How, how, do, how does one get there? Any of you in here focused on information technology as a, a main curriculum, IT? How many of you are focused on supply chain? Good, we have a hiring group in the room. Um, we, we can use a lot of your talent. Today, our customers are thinking quite differently around their investment profile in technology. They're not, not investing in the back office. But over the course of the last 30 years, they've spent countless tens of billions of dollars on building out the back office to drive productivity gains. They've invested in networking infrastructure, data center infrastructure, software applications residing in the data center to be delivered out to users at their desktop, on their PCs, via mobile devices. A huge amount of money has been spent, and by the way, productivity has been gained. They haven't fully exhausted all of that productivity, but they've exhausted all of the early gains ones get, one gets when you move voraciously into a space like that you follow the herd to gain share or to gain productivity. Today, my dialogue with customers is quite different. They're moving a lot of their investment focus to the front office. I had a conversation with a customer yesterday, a bank, who casually mentioned that of their, <laughs> of their $1 billion capital plan for their branches, half of it was going into the branch and customer experience-based technologies. Half. All of a sudden, technology decisions around the front office, which used to not be really on the IT person's docket or on the CIO's radar, they're taking over. And I see this happening in every customer I talk to, every CIO I talk to. And that is because the next generation of productivity gains and the next generation of consumer experience innovation is going to occur with you as you connect, interact, and transact with business. And that's a front office focus. And the reason for that is in this office you have a bunch of digital natives. How many of you, you may not want to raise your hand, are 35 and below? Okay. For those of you who do not raise your hand, like me, we are digital immigrants. Those who, rose, who raise their hands are digital natives. And the way they conduct themselves with business is very different than me or you if you fall into the digital immigrant category. In fact, the younger you go, the more different it is. You know, my son, who's 15 years old, I, he speaks a completely different language in the world of the digital world. And by the way, I consider myself a fairly hip guy in the digital world. <laughs> he is on a different planet. He, he, he thinks email is like prehistoric. A mouse is a joke. The way he buys off the web is, 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 is confusing to me. The way he uses mobile devices and the internet and point of service technologies is different. Businesses, their future buyers, their current buyers, are you, those people, that group of people that connect, interact, and transact with business entirely different than the way they used to. And they are frightened of these massive changes. They're confused. The next big channel that they're confused about and they want help with is the social channel. Becoming a channel to market, social networking. 
we are attacking this problem. Our company is destined to help companies deal with these fundamental shifts in consumer behavior, digital natives and the impact on their business, and help them get control back by virtue of the investments we're making in our company organically and inorganically. One interesting statistic, by the way, a front office statistic is, the average cost of you going into a bank branch to do a deposit, when you go to sit on a line, you talk to, has anybody done a deposit in a bank branch recently? Okay, many of you. It's about, it's about $4.15 that cost, because you, there's a human being involved, there's labor involved, etc. When you do that same deposit at an ATM, the bank saves $3.85 every time you do that. That's a massive productivity gain. That's a cost save, it's a productivity save, and you like it better than standing online in the bank branch. That's a great example of the front office and its impact on business. So everything you've heard in the last few slides leads you to one conclusion for us. We're focused on a merged channel world. A world where you can start a transaction in one channel and seamlessly end it in another channel. And while we focus primarily on point of service, a point of service channel would be an ATM, a self-checkout device, a kiosk at the airport. We're also very focused on the internet and mobile. And what's not on this chart, and the next time you see me will be, social. Because the social channel, as my son tells me, is the next big channel. My son is a great market research device. And he's buying things. He's, he's checking things out with his friends over Facebook like I've never seen before. There's this tremendous dialogue that takes place over social channels. I'm not on Facebook. My security team will not allow me to be on Facebook. But I check it out. I check my sons out when he's not looking. Um, and I see these things, and they're, they're fantastic. And it's a wonderful channel for us to engage in. How many of you in the audience, by raise of hand, were familiar with that NCR? My team didn't raise their hands, and that's really freaking scary. <laughs> um, my point is, is that that's the kind of significant and destructive, in a creative way, transformation that you must go through as a company to survive. To survive successfully and be meaningful and connect the meaningful outside to your customers. That is what we have gone through as a company. And great companies do this every decade, every other decade, in a way that allows you to change your perception of them. And perception changing is a hard game. None of you raised your hands. Our job is to have you all raise your hands in the next several years. But if you talk to my customers, they know that NCR. And they're learning more about that NCR every single day. And it's an NCR that has to drive sustainable growth along the way. Try that trick in a world that we live in today, where growth is hard to come by, and emerging markets are difficult at best to navigate, and developed markets are extremely tough. We have to do all of that, and we will. And we are. I thought what would be good is if we have time, I don't know if you do have time, to take a few questions from the audience with that as a backdrop of the company so that we could at least get into some meaningful dialogue. One or two questions? Yes, indeed. Uh, we'll open it up. I know some of you have to go to class. Like a few minutes more, so we... Forget about class. Hang here. <laughs> I'm much more interesting, I'm sure. I'll answer a few questions. How long is your paper?
paper technology going to exist? How long is my what? Paper technology, your coated papers, your register, your, your tennis plan. Our consumables basic technology, our, 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 our two-sided paper, our single-sided paper. That's a difficult question to answer because e-receipts and other digital forms of receipt technology have not really taken off dramatically. People use them and people still want receipt technologies available to them. I think it has a very long tail. Is it a growth business? No. But it has a long tail. It's a long tail technology that has many years ahead of it. Go right ahead. How do we instill creativity and innovation? Well, you have to create an environment where people feel like they can create. I just, had a, I just had a dialogue with a bunch of engineers in Dallas, Texas, and one of the people there asked me, um, this, is a, this is a company we just acquired, and they were, you know, they don't know our company, they don't know who we are. And so he said to me, he goes, what, what do you consider, um, a great engineer is in, in, in your company? And my answer was very simple. A great engineer is an artist, not a scientist. The best engineers I've ever worked with in my life were artists. They painted by tapping out creative code that was meaningful and powerful for customers. They were not tapping out code to some program that was destined by a project to deliver an outcome by X date. They were creating. So you have to create an environment where people feel like that. You have to have a talent management program that allows you to hire and develop people along those lines. You have to celebrate successes with people who, who drive that kind of creativity and innovative in your company. We have an award at our company called the C.K. Prahalad Award for Disruptive Innovation. Do, do you know C.K. Prahalad in the audience? Some of you? C.K. used to be on our board and he passed away suddenly a few years ago, tragically, and we created an award for him and we give that award out every year to engineers who demonstrate wonderful, creative, powerful technological advances in our company but are more artistic in my mind than they are scientific in my mind. We have a venture, venture board in our company. Uh, we have an innovation council in our company. Um, all sorts of mechanisms to continue to drive it and we always celebrate our roots. So there's many ways you do it but it's always about tone at the top. I was amazed by the you're referring to the mobile phones and their role in transformation, uh, transforming the developing countries. I just attended a UN presentation on how they're going to use that in India to promote sustainable development. Do you see a link between these new technologies and sustainable development in emerging markets or not? Well, no question, right? I mean, there's uh, the sustainable growth in emerging markets and, and development will have to be driven by technology in many cases. Um, the new infrastructure, the new stimulus, in my mind, is not about building roads, bridges, and tunnels. It's about building technology infrastructure and spending more money, time, and effort in those spaces. And I will say, emerging markets get that more than we get it. And they do it. I gave you the Africa example of the fact that in Africa, in some countries, they use the mobile device for banking more than they do a bank, a traditional bank. You'll see that more and more over time. In India, there's a great focus on using technology to advance per capita income growth, driving middle class growth, putting people into the financial system to get them to move forward in a more progressive way. Many different markets around the world will use technology to drive that. The stock today closed, I don't know, at 18 and change? 18 and change? Can you still buy shares? Can you still buy shares? You can buy shares immediately tomorrow morning. 
At 9.30, right, Bob? At 9.30. I'm in a quiet period, so I can't tell you to buy them or not, so I must say that publicly. <laughs> Hand up in the back, gentleman in the back with the brown jacket. I've been in banking for a while, and I understand that I'm familiar with some of the NCR technology. Yep. How does Depot, as a competitive interest, as a direct competitive, compete with NCR technology? How does a competitor compete with us? Depot. Depot. Oh, Depot. Depot is primarily in the ATM space, primarily in the financial services space. So they have a piece of what we do. They're a, uh, a point competitor of NCRs in the financial space. By the way, a very good one, a good company. Uh, they have good products. Uh, they have good management. Um, we respect them enough to every day wake up and want to, want to beat them um, in that space. Uh, and they compete in all dimensions of the business on a product level with us, services, um, end-to-end solutions in the branch, uh, and, and software as well. So they have a software set of technologies that competes with ours also. Well, there's a lot that goes into that, young lady. Um, uh, lots of emerging markets um, support their local companies tremendously. China is a great example of this. While we have market access in China, and by the way, great market access to China. China is a huge market for NCR. We're the number one market share leader in ATMs in China. Over any local or international player. But the local player will, in many ways, as they work towards closing a, a deal and they're competing with NCR, maybe D-Bold, uh, will perhaps have a leg up in some circumstances based on the fact that they are local. There's some jingoism, of course, in many of these countries. There's a national pride in many of these countries. Sometimes if you have a government that has some ownership in business, so, so, so more of a, a socialistic environment, um, you can have government participate in, in making a decision or playing a role in a decision. Um, so there's many different variables in terms of competing with a local player. But I'd say nationalism is a big one. Um, I'd say secondarily, some of these local players are good. They have good technology. Uh, and, and perhaps because they do things without the burden of legacy, they have newer technology at lower cost. Their labor pools cost less than our labor pools, so they can offer a sim similar, not exact, perhaps similar product at a lower cost than us. In the back, I'll take this young lady right in the middle. You're welcome. Say, say again. And, and like you we were saying, the technology infrastructure, as the governmental portion, instead of the road, railroads, and, and uh, infrastructure for like highways, if we were to incorporate the technology infrastructure, how does that help the employment rate when it saves the vendor money by not having to employ as many people because there'll be like a kiosk or. I understand. I think there's a, a, a very common, unfortunate, misnomer about technology and its impact on employment. Uh, let me give you a great example. When Home Depot deploys our self-checkout, and you might say, well, gosh, somebody just lost a job who was a checkout clerk. That doesn't, that's not what happens. What they do is they recycle that spending into a higher paying job to put someone on the floor as a salesperson. So in essence, the trickle-down effect of that is you may lose 
a role, a job that was paying 40000 a year, but pick up one that was paying 60000 a year, and you get better service as a result. The problem that some of our customers were faced with wasn't just labor costs at the front end. In Home Depot's case, it was, I want to provide better service again. Our whole life, our whole company, our founding of our company was on when you came into a Home Depot store, there was somebody in an orange vest who knew what they were talking about, who can give you help and support in aisle. And over many years, I think if you spoke to Frank and his team, he'd say they began to cut back on that kind of, that kind of labor. And they wanted to reinvest in that kind of labor, so they recycled dollars. It's the same thing that happens in government. Same exact process in government. You can have higher paying jobs on the back end of your technology stimulus than you can on infrastructure stimulus. So when you do the math, you'll find out that the trickle down effect of doing that, you'll have people at higher wages paying more taxes, higher level more service jobs in the country, and you'll be moving up the scale of value in that circumstance, retraining people who were once doing a transaction-based job to do a more value-added job. And that's what technology does for countries, for businesses, every single day. Are there circumstances where business takes out labor and takes the cost to the bottom line? Of course there is. But that's not in every case. It's not the purpose of technology. And what's your choice? You don't invest in technology, and then you'll be left behind. I'm sorry for being late again. Thank you so much for your time. I had a great time with you. Um, Bill, on behalf of our president, Dr. Tim Hines, all the students, faculty, and staff in the College of Business at Clinton State, this is a little mental, a little token of our appreciation that you can remember for your visit today on our great campus. Well, thank you very much. I'll put it in okay. my office proudly. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Get to class. Yeah. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. I do want to take a moment to recognize some senior executives who are here tonight with us from NCR. Um, Chris Askew, okay, how about Chris? Yeah. Um, Chris is Senior Vice President for Global Services. Um, John Bruno, is John here? Okay. Uh, John is Executive Vice President for NCR. Andrea Letford. Andrea is Senior Vice President for Human Resources, and I will need to talk about our students, okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, Scott Kingsfield, Scott, couldn't make it, okay? Um, Bob Fishman, uh, CFO, he's got all the money, okay? okay. Um, Rick McQuad, is Rick here? Rick McQuad, no, okay? Uh, Janet Brewer, Vice President for Communications. Um, I'd like to thank all of you, all of the students, all of our faculty. I also want to thank all of our community business leaders who are here tonight to join us. Uh, on this occasion, I'd like to now uh, formally invite you all, uh, our guests and faculty and staff, to a reception that we're going to have right next door at the atrium of the Continuing Education Center. I know the students have waited patiently, but I also want to take this moment to Thank all of the students who are here. Have a round of applause for our students. I hope you have been inspired. I hope you've been educated. I hope you've been informed by our speaker today. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next year for another great event.